It's nice to see you all here on the last day of the Congress. Welcome to Overtaking Property Software Without Writing Code, a talk by Olivier Kleinen. Um, he gives us a few insights how we as technicians can change the software market of tomorrow. So have a big applause for Olivier and enjoy your talk. Thank, thanks very much. Um, so the content of the presentation is rather short and simple. So that's the way I like talks to be. Uh, first, a short overview of the market. Then we'll see the main obstacles we have to overcome to make a big difference in that, in that market. Then we shift gears, and then we overtake. So before I start, if this works, okay. Who's that guy anyway? That's a brief presentation about me, because I'm always curious when I attend presentations, who is the person speaking up there? So it won't be long on that one, too. Uh, Olivier24, that's me, hello. Uh, I'm originally from the aerospace industry, so I'm not a software guy um, uh, by, by for, uh, didn't start this way. I'm still passionate about the concept of free software, free as in freedom. I co-founded the GNU Linux Matters nonprofit uh, last year. Uh, we do on, go on to do some marketing on the internet for free software. I'm a very poor programmer. So if you expected to come here and get some very cool PHP tricks or JavaScript or whatever, uh, please leave now because I'm really a uh, very poor programmer. I don't like it. And as a hobby, I ride very old bicycles and I like to throw frisbees as well. So that's it. Uh, first, I'd like to get a view of the software market. So. If you think of software, typically you think of this. It's a series of logical arguments. It's logic. It's, math it's just like mathematics. So because it's just pure thoughts applied to hardware, you can share it, you can exchange it, you can modify it, you can hack it. And I think the whole point of 24C3 um, is to work on, on that kind of thing. And that's very nice because then once you see it as logic, you have no reason to restrict people from, from doing this. But for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to ask you to forget that vision of software. And when you think of software, to think of this, if it shows up. This is the software market on personal computers in the world. That little red dot here is free software. This is not free software, OK? So I like to put that picture up, because typically, we write the best software ever. And we love to do it. Um, we're very proud of how many million users uh, we have if using Linux, Firefox, whatever, throughout the world. And forget that the vast majority of the software running there for people is not free in the world. Incidentally, that happens to be the same figure for the proportion of women in the open source free software community. And I'm, ve I'm very sad about this. I, I, wish, uh, I wish it was otherwise as well. But only one topic per presentation. So. If I had to present software to an investor or somebody who's not familiar with it, I would do it the following way. So hopefully you won't learn anything here, but just a reminder of how, from an external point of view, uh, people see the software market. Typically, this is not really working very well. I think the battery is dying. There's one billion PCs worldwide. It's going to be two billion in five years, so quite a lot of personal computers. 95% of users, they don't care about software. We care about software. You're here in 24C3 because typically you know you like how to hack a computer, you understand what software is, but 95% of people, they don't like it. There are two different approaches to making software. When software is just like hardware, that's the Microsoft approach. You buy it a box, it's very expensive, it wears out, you throw it away, you buy a new one, okay? And the other version is, ah, I shouldn't walk very far with <laughs> that remote. <laughs> the other version is software is just like maths. So just something that's common to most people. You can exchange it, you copy it, you improve it, but no one owns it, really. It doesn't make sense to say, I own an equation, or I own a, a, a matrix, or whatever. There are only two ways to enter the market of software, and only two, not three. Arrive pre-installed. That means when Joe buys his hardware, the software is there already, whether it's free or not, but it should be here already. And the second way, just give up, <laughs> the second way is the network effect. That means somehow you reach 
10, 15, maybe 20% of the market by a miracle, and then you grow organically uh, from there on. Because people want and like to have the same software as other people, the same formats, and so on. So only two ways to win are just to remember that building very good software, the perfect piece of software, just won't make it. You have to work your way through only these two possibilities to enter the market and make a big dent. Technically, so that's just a presentation that I typically make to an investor or a non-techy uh, guy. This FOSS and BOSS, FOSS, you all know, is free open source software. BOSS is big old school software. And I like to call it this way because uh, every time I log on to a Windows computer, I forget about how hard it is to use it because of the viruses. You have to fight against the viruses or fight against the antivirus. So just plug in your USB key and it, uh, it just has to scan the whole, the whole thing every time it's a nightmare. And the, on the other side, you have the live CD. So just the most representative piece of technical, so, what, what, what we can achieve technically, one side is still hogged by viruses, despite having a huge income from software. The other side can produce things such as like live CD. I think the live CD is really amazing. You have a single CD, entire operating system working out of the box on most computers, very impressive. Economically, um, that's that, that's the, si the slide that hurts, okay? Uh, Microsoft turnover is about $40 billion per year. That's 40,000 million, a lot of money. And the other uh, number that we don't like to, to read is the first month of Vista, they sold 20 million units. So we, we, we go on to speak about how bad Vista is, how poor the sales are because the IT professionals don't like it, and so on. On the first month, they sold 20 million units. There's possibly 10 million P Linux users out there, possibly 15 million. But in one month, Microsoft managed to sell 20 million users. You have to be careful with this number because what Microsoft sells is not to the end users. It sells to companies like HP, Acer, Dell, and it doesn't mean that this license already sold to the end users. Okay, I have, to, I have to check my numbers. I, I read this in a, in a usually reliable newspaper, a French newspaper as well. So I don't know what exactly it means, but I'm confident that it, there's, it's some sort of indicator that what, uh, the, the scale on which Microsoft works and the scale on which Linux users work are really different. In just one month, we, we took, it took us 10 years or 15 years to get 10 million uh, Linux users. On the other side, I don't have actually a number uh, to present. And the, there's also a cultural impact that's maybe out of the topic a little bit, but maybe the, the, the whole point of all this is what kind of world you want to leave your kids when they, when they turn up. The word, kind of world I want to leave my kids is not a world where you buy software and it's a machine. It's just like a box and it's, it's expensive, it's really nice, it's cool, but, and then with it, you can do just about everything. With a single piece of software, you can do your phone, it manages your, your whole life. I prefer the, word, the, the way Wikipedia worked with this huge mess, it's not entirely reliable, uh, it keeps growing, it's never finished, it's never complete, but it's a lot more fun, it's a lot more interesting as a society. So that's just market overview, just to remind ourselves, okay, we, we make the best software ever, um, but uh, we're still, still not there, still not there. And we, we need to be reminded of this, I think, uh, pretty often. So what kind of obstacles do we have to overcome to really make a difference? The first obstacle is nobody chooses his or her software. And when I mean nobody, it's all the people that are not sitting in, in the conference room in, in, this, in Berlin right now. And that's the vast majority of people. Now, why don't they choose their software? It's because they have other things to do. Typically, our life as consumers is extremely complicated. Whether you want to buy batteries or toothpaste, whatever you want to buy, you have a consumer choice to make. It's a complicated choice. There's the expensive version, the medium version, uh, there's the blue one, the green one, and so on. So by the time people come home, and they're clever people, they do many interesting things, but when, the time, when we come, come home in the evening, they just like to sit on, the t sit on the couch and watch TV a little bit, or maybe play with their kids, or whatever, but not change the software on their computer. It needs to work out of the box. To understand this, I like the car analogy. Uh, you all like software, you all like uh, 
hacking things, but you probably have a car. This is a French car, I'm sorry. Uh, typical French car, uh, not, not brilliant, but uh, uh, pretty, pretty good sales. Nevertheless, this car has tires. It has four wheels, four tires. Just like software on a computer, you need tires to drive a car. Who knows the brand and the type of car, of tires they have in their car? Raise your hand. Nobody? Okay, three, four, five people. It's, it's, not, it's not the main concern. Uh, you sit in your car, maybe you like your car, but you're not going to care about every bit, every part of your car. So I don't know anything about tires. I don't know anything about uh, tires on my car. I don't care because I've got better things to think about than, than this. It may be hugely important. Maybe there may be an environmental aspect to it, many, many aspects. But we have to understand nobody chooses his or her software. The second problem is that we'll never have a killer app. And I think it's the, typically something we forget uh, very much. We won't have a killer app because typically in the open source of free software movement, uh, we share ideas and the, the ideas get copied, copied over very quickly. It's not a bug, it's a feature, it's a very nice thing. Uh, but nevertheless, it, ma it makes that in the end, we never have one application that can stand out and switch the whole people to your operating system. Um, on the other hand, we do have killer applications on the other side, which will probably it will take a long time to, to, to make equivalents of. Um, so we have to remember this because in most software projects on the internet, they try to build the killer app, which will never happen. Obstacle number three, the legal environment is hostile. Now, um, this sounds a little scary or a little complicated, but there are two simple examples for the end user, the MP3 and the DVD. When you put a Ubuntu operating system onto your computer, it doesn't read MP3s, it doesn't read DVDs. And most people don't understand and don't want to understand because they have better things to do, uh, why it is so. Um, this is not code related, it's legal related. Who says legal? It's political. So it means that people, just, just like two guys who stood there uh, previously, actually do um, things to try to change governments, standards, body, and things like this. So to make sure that you have the freedom to read your own MP3s which you bought leg legitimately, leg legitimately and your own DVDs. Um, very big problem. We can't get around this one. We can change ourselves to adapt to the other ones. But this one, until we change the laws around MP3s and DVDs, we'll never see a Ubuntu computer in MediaMarkt. Okay? It's, it's a killer... Uh, it's, a, it's a killer bag. You cannot avoid it. We have to change the law to have MP3s and DVDs on our computers. Number four, the operating system is disappearing. And this is a complicated point to make. Uh, I usually need a, a few slides to do that. So, what do I mean with this? This is a computer. Down there is Joey. Not you, not me, not, not us. Joey, just the average user, he's got some kind of interface to the hardware, and over there is the internet. Okay? And we do the software. Software is the bit that runs the hardware according to, to what Joey wants to do with it. Okay? That's what we're good at doing. And things got a little more complicated when we added a printer and some Wi-Fi. But nevertheless, we make the best software ever. A Ubuntu Live CD is probably the nicest and most advanced piece of technology. You can, you can have software running this hardware there. So what's the problem? Why is the operating system disappearing? Well, because the picture I've shown is typically two, um, year 2000. In year 2008 or 7, still, things look different. You still have your Joe user down there and still have your computer there, but now the internet has grown dramatically. Not just in size, but in, in, the, um, in the weight and the important place in, in, uh, importance in place in our everyday lives. Joe doesn't just use a desktop PC sitting in his um, living room. He uses a laptop, some kind of gizmo device, TVs and everything. And all of these devices, GPS, whatever, uh, you meet them now in just about every device around, and they have software in it. And more and more, this software has personal data, manages your, um, your files, your formats, personal information, social information, and so on. They're more and more um, connected to the internet. Now the TV, um, suppose you have the same friends, we have the, these, these uh, boxes you buy, provide internet, telephone and TV um, streaming. Um, 
they're connected by, to some kind of network, which is or is not the internet. Every time, there's a restriction on the connection. So five, ten years ago, uh, you bought an ADSL connection, and you paid for that, and the company at the other side would just carry data over. Take your bits, your ones and zeros, carry them over and back and forth between you and other people on the internet. Right now, things have changed because people have realized there's no real big money to be made just carrying the ones and zeros. It's just a matter of hardware and how well you manage hardware. There is a lot of money to be made once you provide content, things like movies, um, ringtones, you've got music, you've got all sorts of exciting things that your internet access provider uh, wants to, you to buy. So they, they're not just access provider now, that they're content providers. And that would be okay. It's a lot harder to hack this series of devices to get software on them. But it's okay. It would still be okay if we didn't actually stop, progressively stop using these devices there to run our private lives and using servers uh, over the internet. So that's Gmail, and that's YouTube, that's whatever kind of Web 2.0 or not Web 2.0 application standing on the internet carrying your personal culture, your personal information, and so on. And that makes the whole picture very hard um, to, to look at, very hard, and the situation is very messy. It's a lot harder changing the software on all these computers there because they're not standing in your living room and they're typically private servers. So this means that you have services like the latest hype technology or uh, that all want to do something just like iTunes, which technically not quite so, but in, in, the, in the way it works, almost streams your music from the server every time you press, you, you press the play button on your iPod. There's a chain of proprietary software secret software, secret protocols, everything between you, the, the play button on your iPod and the iTunes server over at Apple. And that's very, very hard to change. It's very hard to modify this software, have access to. And I was a big user of Gmail, trying to give, it progress, give up progressively. It's terribly hard because Gmail is well-made and so on. But what these people do with my emails, with all the information there, they have no clue, have no possibility to study that. So we have four problems, right? Just a quick recap. Nobody chooses his or her software. We'll never have a killer app. The legal environment is hostile. That's the MP3 and DVD things. We can't get around this one. And the operating system is disappearing. So, shift gears. And when I mean shift gears, it's not shift up, it's shift down. It's just the, what you do before you pass. And we do pass in France as well, um, French cars. Okay. There are two things we need to do when, I mean, shift down is start um, thinking back down to Joe. Talk to Joe is, for example, not using that kind of picture. I find this very funny. You've got a very nice Vista operating system on a brand new computer in MediaMarkt or elsewhere and with a blue screen of death. But, um, fortunately for us, it's not funny for Joe. Uh, Joe uh, does have blue screen of death from time to time, and it's not a big deal. It's a big deal for us. It's not a big deal for him. Just reboots the computer and keeps going. It, stability of software is not a big requirement for personal computers uh, user. And I come back to uh, my French car. Now, you remember um, I, I, I took the tires example. I want to spend time on this again. To try to put yourself into Joe's uh, mind, just imagine you want to buy new tires. And you step into the store, and there's a very nice Bista tires store there. Okay? And you don't have this much time. It's Saturday morning, and you want new tires because you want to go shopping or have, uh, go to 24C3, whatever. And the vendor comes in, and you have the number one version. Number one version is 100 euros. Okay, very standard, very basic, works nice, no problem. I have number two version. Number two version is 200 euros, and it's a little nicer looking. It's uh, transparent things and nice looking uh, stuff. And then you have number three version. Number three uh, version is 300 euros, and that's the pff, real cool experience. Uh, shady, nice looking tires, okay? But the choice is pretty simple. You've got three tires, and they're the Beastat tires. 
What about the freedom tires? Now, you start mentioning this word, and the, and the vendor goes all, <laughs> is all enthusiastic about it. Oh, freedom tires. Oh, you must be a connoisseur. Okay, so you got bad, bad Binnix tires. Oh, that's really cool. And you got the Bubuntu. That's the, uh, <laughs> that's the common version. And then you've got this open source concept, right? It's, it's open source tires, and you ban driva, that's the French one. <laughs> and it's not always costless, right? Okay, it's, it's free, uh, as in freedom, if it's a little complicated, but actually there's a lot of money going on there. And you've got Bandras, Bandras is like uh, American tires, very nice. But in your sense, it's totally free. It's the ultimate pure tires. And then, oh, it's not called Binux, it's called Bnu Binux, right? It's Bnu, B-N-U, slash Binux, that's the original name for it. And this Libra tires uh, concept is crazy, I know, but... And Bidorite, uh, straight from uh, track technology, Bidorite, uh, really rocks. I run Bidorite. Oof. Because what would be your choice if these were tires? Now, you all see the software analogy there. But think tires and think what you would prefer. You don't have a lot of time. You have to install some kind of fiddle around with this nice array of choices there, or this simple one, two, three, expensive, but works, and are installed on your, t on your car. I know which one I would choose. I don't care this much about tires. So talk to Joe and start to think, um, think put yourself in his... his um, his uh, mind. Number two is be relevant. And that's source code. I hate source code. I hate programming. That's source code from Firefox. And my proposal is let's kill source code, okay? Because typically um, you have a nice software, piece of software, and you go to the, uh, just like take Inkscape. Inkscape is a brilliant piece of software, it's just a vector drawing. I like it a lot, I use it a lot. You type inkscape.org and you've got pff, roughly, just typically for your average project, two buttons. One is the latest stable version. That doesn't uh, sound very encouraging. And you have the download source code button down there, which is pff, very scary. And for Joe, it's totally irrelevant. The source code thing, doesn't make any sense. He's never, ever, ever going to even want to see source code. And that's another French car. <laughs> sorry to, sorry to uh, impose this to you German people. This is my dad's car. Okay, it's a big car, a two-ton car. It's a big engine in there uh, by French standards. Okay, so it's really 120, 130 horsepower. And you open the incredibly small um, um, uh, cover at the front, and there you got plastic, and you got three holes. It's not, this is not even the hole, it's just the battery cap. You've got the oil, just in case you would want to put the oil yourself, and then you've got the, the washing uh, part for the wipers. And the point here is nobody requests source code anywhere. Nobody wants to know how the engine in this car works. Not anymore. Uh, on old cars, you can usually fiddle around and move things around. But right now, it's not what people want, because people have better things to do than start worrying about how their car works. So in our 2008 society, my wish is that we stop trying to insist that it's important that people have access to the source code and give that access all the time. Which brings me to that very uh, difficult term, uh, open source and versus free software. And I want to start a troll here. Uh, my experience, having switched uh, quite a few people to free software, is that it's a lot harder to use the free software term. Because immediately comes up the question, what is free software? It's, free, uh, it's not really free as in money, although it mostly is. Most of the time it's free as in freedom. And when you use the open source terms, it works straight away because it's a magical term. Even in French, we have libre, logiciel libre, uh, which is unequivocal. It can't mean free as in costless. And yet we use open source the whole time because it's easy, it's funky, it's bright, it's new. But when the average user at some point uh, has to consider the choice between a proprietary software and a free software. If he thinks free software, it has a lot more weight, a lot more importance in his mind than if he thinks open source, which is nice. Everybody understands open source is nice, but nobody, well not nobody, but maybe not as many people understand that open source has big implications in how society works. So don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that we should not use open source. Free software is good, open source is bad. As many people would 
like me to say, uh, but I'm just saying it's, it pays off a lot better to spend five, ten minutes explaining what free software is to, uh, to people rather than just say, oh, it's open source, because open source is the answer to everything. Uh, short interlude here. Shift, shifting gears is what we do at GNU Linux Matters. That's a small nonprofit organization I co founded last year. Um, our vision is communicating the concept and the importance of free software on a very large scale. So that's um, uh, on the internet, basically. We, we, do web, we build websites explaining what Linux and free software is. And we're looking for funds. We're looking for just about anything. I'm looking for a job. We need money. We need servers. We need petrol to put in the car to go to Fosdem and other things like this. So if you are a wealthy donor, please come and see me at the end. Our main, main process is get GNU-Linux.org. So just explain Linux to everyday users. We, we hope to be the homepage for Linux in general. Not the homepage for Ubuntu, not the homepage for Fedora, just Linux. So you associate the word Linux to some kind of reasonable and clear information and not Linux.org advertising. There's no advertising. What is Linux? Why not Windows? That's the first question people ask. Windows works fine for me. Why should I change? And making the switch. Just what's the live CD? How, how do I install it? Basic, clear information. We also have other projects. We built linuxpreloaded.com, a German version will come soon. Uh, uh, just listing vendors of software, of hardware pre installed with Linux. Not that many around right now, but it's increasing slowly. And softwareliberty.com, explaining free software, the concept, in 250 words. That's, that's the whole website. There's nothing more to it than that. Just explaining to your mom, your dad, what free software is. Not starting with freedom zero, freedom one, freedom four, and so on, uh, with ability to modify the, co the source code, which is all very nice for hackers, but not for my mom and dad. Our objective for 2008 is find one million people on the internet. In many languages, we have translation in German, Spanish, French, and Catalan, so far we, are, we hope to develop more translations. Um, soon, find one million people coming from uh, Google or search engines who run Windows, and we want to explain Linux and free software to them. So, not people who are familiar with Linux or running Linux already, but just new people. Find one million of them in 2008. So that's, that was the part where I was gear shifting. We need to, to slow down a little look at what Joe wants. And now is the part overtaking. Once we've done that, if you think clearly about what Joey user wants, uh, then we can really make a dent. And you remember that big graph with a 1% free and 99% uh, not free? We can change the colors and labels on that, on that graph. So I started start this part with what is business rule number one? And just imagine you have a restaurant, imagine you have um, a shop, imagine you make toothpaste, whatever. Uh, what's business rule number one? What's the most imp single important rule you need to remember uh, to make good business and become rich quickly? Well, I would, my answer to that would be um, watch your market. Here is a histogram. It's a, not a curve, it's a histogram showing the price of your product, say it's toothpaste, and the number of potential customers. This is zero price. If you give toothpaste away at zero price, you have this many people ready to pay a maximum price of zero dollar for toothpaste. If your toothpaste is 100 dollars or 100 euros, you have only this many people ready to buy it. Okay? The maximum price um, that people are ready to pay and then how many people for that maximum price. There's such a curve for just about any product. Uh, corporations will spend millions of dollars just to get that curve for anything for just water, for toothpaste, for watches, and so on. And so the, my golden room for these, the ability to match your market. Why am I saying this? Because that customer here, he's ready to pay, say, $100 for a watch. This customer here is only ready to pay $10 for a watch. There are also many people who are never going to want to watch whatever price you, you, you sell it at. The benefit you can make with these few people ready to pay $100 for a watch, is immensely higher than these many people uh, for, for $25 a watch. 
So never let the people who are ready to pay a lot for, for, your, for your product get away with the cheaper version. You want, to make the, you, you want them to buy a more expensive version. And if you want a real life example, just look at that, these fog lights on cars. Okay? Many cars, not all cars, have these lights, I don't know the exact terms in English, um, these lights are really near the ground, the front of the car, they look really nice. Uh, in my area, um, there's never any fog, never any fog at all. I live in, in Nice, in France. Uh, there's some in my cars, when, this, when we have fog uh, in the north of France, I'll switch the lights on and it doesn't make any difference. So why do people actually buy them? Because of that kind of graph. If you're ready to pay, say, 30,000 euros for a car, and the car only costs 29,500 euros, then you're going to buy the cheaper car. You're going to save $500, which you weren't ready to spend, but didn't spend. So the vendor will simply think, hmm, we need to make a nicer looking, a slightly more expensive car to get the whole benefit, the whole maximum price that people are ready to pay. Okay, so is, is that sort of clear for, for that graph? It's pretty important. Uh, and I would rephrase that as this rule. This is a bit naive, I would say that's 1920 marketing. If you're in 19, 2008, you would say ability to match and shape your market. Because with good communication, with good marketing, you can change the curve around. For software, 10 years of good marketing has made the curve this big. So you have people who are ready to pay a fortune for the computer. That small segment of the market is taken by Apple. They were never want to step down. Apple's never going to make a, a, a uh, software, of people for, software and hardware for people just ready to spend a little money because that part's highly lucrative. You got a bunch of people ready to pay quite a lot of money for software, and you got a very small number of people who are not ready to pay anything for software. I'm not ready to pay anything for software anymore, but I used to be in that, in that zone. Okay, 100 euros, fair enough. I can pay 100 euros for a operating system. So our job now is to think in terms of market and get the people who are ready to pay 100 euros to actually refuse to pay this much for software. So we want this curve to look like this. Okay? I wouldn't touch this, this part too much. These, these people are hard to convince. But we, we, we need... <laughs> they're really hard to switch. Uh, <laughs> but we really need to convince people that, that move, move shift, shift the market. And that's pretty hard to do. The boss companies, the big old school software companies, they know this. They look at this curve very intensively all day long and try to adapt to the markets, have products for every segment of the market. That's the one, two, three I showed you to, uh, earlier. There's people ready to pay 300 euros, 200 euros, 100 euros. So basically you develop one nice version, you strip down the version progressively, you put different prices on them, and then you can reach different segments of the market. Thoughts? Well, stability forking, okay? Completely unaware of what the market wants, which is build software. And that's because of the V0.12 syndrome. I like to call it this way. The symptoms are a total dedication to quality. We build good software, and that's what we do. We, we, we want good quality, that's what we want. It's released when it's ready. Who hasn't heard this? When is the next version of uh, uh, WordPress or Firefox going to be released? It's released when it's ready. Okay? I'm not going to release bad code out there. I want good code to be released. I'm building good software. An overwhelming disposition to forking. As soon as, this, as there is the slightest disagreement inside a project, people fork. I take the whole code, I'm going to make my own project, so I change the name, I change this or that feature, and voila, you've got another 251 distros out there. Uh, uh, it's slightly not the same, mostly does the same thing, but it's different, it's my own little project. And yet, and there's only one idea in my conference I want to remember, and this, this one is just about to come now, so pay attention. Quality has never been a decisive factor. Quality is important. But quality is not what the customer wants directly. And before you start booing me and then throwing sticks at me and things, let me give you a few examples of that. OpenOffice.org. Uh -huh. Who who's so proud of OpenOffice.org that they carry an OpenOffice.org CD around saying, 
Ah, do you want to see what free software, free open source software can do? Who would show openoffice.org to a friend who's running Vista and Microsoft Office saying, look, uh, this is the bleeding edge software? It's not, it's terrible quality. It's big, it's bloated, it's heavy. Um, it's, I mean, who, whoever tried to use stylings and menus or, or who, who uses three, I use three languages, just telling the stupid program it's not German, it's incredibly hard, incredibly complicated. But it's a stunning success. Uh, you've got 100 million people using openoffice.org throughout the world, 10 times more than Linux users. Uh, I use openoffice.org because I'm pretty sure that if <laughs> the display of my computer fails or it doesn't work with the Beamer or whatever, I just carry the ODP file and pretty much anyone in the audience we will have openoffice.org on their computer. And it really makes a difference. Uh, openoffice.org community is a major factor in opening file formats. We've seen it just before. Then we've got Flying Steve jumping around Europe uh, and the, the USA trying to convince people that um, the Microsoft formats is open and is XML. And that would not ever have happened if OpenOffice didn't exist. Okay, 100 billion users are there, many billions of documents in ODT format. That really, really makes a difference. Let's take another example. Firefox. Now, granted, Firefox is great quality. And it, with the message, the branding, the, the attitude of the whole Firefox community is serving this cool. You've got a cool surface out there. They want Firefox. That's the market segment. There was a, brand, a, a big gap in the market a few years ago, two, three years ago, for a cool browser. And Firefox jumped in there. OK, perfect quality, probably the highest quality software you can get. But quality is not the recipe. It's not because it's high quality that it works. People enjoy, enjoy the quality. But the quality was there before. It was called Mozilla Application Suite. Okay? It never took off at all. But it took some branding, some cutting down, some stripping down, um, some segmentation, market segmentation, saying, okay, we're going to concentrate on surfing these cool people. And Marketing that, so you strip that program down, you keep the same feature, the same quality, and voila, now you got 100 million users throughout the world. Uh, There's a product, I like it because it talks to Joe. It manages to convince people to install Firefox. Firefox never comes pre installed, and many decisions of installing Firefox are going, wrong, uh, going, going on while I speak. Um, but the problem is it must continually prove itself better. Why? Because most Firefox users don't know that it's free software. So whenever Internet Explorer rises from the ashes again on their Windows XP machine, they have to make the decision again, do I want to keep Firefox and make sure it's default again on my computer, or do I just keep this nice, shiny new version of Internet Explorer? So uh, because it lacks the selling argument that it's a free software, there's this decision process going on all the time. Let's take a third example, that's Ubuntu from Canonical. It's not any better than two, 250 other distros. I installed Fedora on the computer just to try to see uh, what the difference was. There's practically no difference. It's GNOME, uh, same program, same applications. Um, yeah, it's different. Uh, people can identify Ubuntu uh, pretty easily. That's horrible brown color on the, on the windows and the back, desktop background. And it's friendly, friendly, friendly. It's the friendliest distribution around. It's marketed as such. The forms are friendly. The documentation is friendly. Wiki, whatever you want. The whole community is friendly, friendly, friendly. Not the hacking distro, but the friendly distro, friendly, friendly Linux. That's a, se a market segment. They do a lot of work outside of code writing. Okay, so they, they write good quality software, but what made them take over 50% of the, of the uh, Linux distributions is not the quality, it's marketing. It's saying, we're going to be different, we're going to market this kind of people out there. And that's a lot of work outside. That's branding, so that's the horrible brown color, because you can identify Ubuntu uh, PC from far away, so if you see the screen, the drivers, uh, try to develop many drivers and pre-install uh, Ubuntu on, on computers now. You buy computers pre-installed pre -install with Linux, 90% of the cases will be uh, Ubuntu. And it's not afraid to be relevant. It's not afraid to say to Joe, this is free software. You can copy me, you can pass it around to friends, you can participate in the community, and I think that's really important. That's what Firefox fails to do. 
Um, interestingly, it works with, with Ubuntu. So what about your project? Well, what will make your project stand out? And I think the lesson to learn for the three previous examples is you have to build sharp software, not good software. You have to think first about what the people want, not what they say they want, but what they really want. If you ask an office user uh, what they want for openoffice.org, they're going to tell you, I want a super stable application, I want a cool application, blah, 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 blah. blah. But they're never going to tell you, I want an application that just does exactly what Microsoft Office does, which is the market segment that openoffice.org took. So build sharp software, not good software. Which brings me to the checklist for sharpening your free software. The handbook, I haven't written it yet, but the checklist is there already. So a few, quite a few items there. So first, talk to Joe and be relevant. Uh, the end user is going to be your uh, customer. Uh, even if they don't pay, they still have some kind of expectation, they still have they still can be segmented, they have different um, desires for your software, and you need to take account of this. So don't think in terms of what is my vision of a, say, uh, a uh, vector drawing program, but try to think what would Joe want. Don't stay focused on the PC operating system, that's the operating system is disappearing uh, part, remember? So um, a lot of things are moving on to Google applications and, and such on the internet. Don't stay focused on a personal computer um, project. That's very hard to do, but uh, we need to think about this. Kick quality out of the throne, okay? It's not the goddess. Uh, it's important, it's really important, but it's not what we should aim at. So fix security bugs. Nobody wants their data flying around on the internet or on their computer or being erased. They want to keep their vacation pictures very safe, but that's all. Uh, security safety bugs, that's it. Stick to your users, so do what they want. Uh, it sounds obvious, but it's really hard to do when, when you start to build an application. You usually have one vision of the application, and it's not always what the users uh, want. Release when it's wanted not when it's ready. Okay? Microsoft never ever waited for uh, software to be ready. And look how successful they are. They're in the big blue part on the, on the, on the, on the screen. Uh, I should the first, okay? Avoid forking at all costs. That's community work. That's having nice forums, a nice, a nice atmosphere there, making people want to stick to your community instead of just taking the code and doing something else. Forking is killing us. It makes 250 distributions instead of 5 to 10 that are required, and it really is a big, uh, big problem. It's a huge mess in the tires I've shown earlier. Join the FSF. And that's no joke, uh, because these, just even if you're not idealist or whatever, uh, just the MP3s and DVDs, uh, they're not going to be solved through code. We've got the code to decode MP3, we've got the code to decode DVDs, but the legal rights to pre-install them on uh, computers you can find in Media Markt, uh, we don't have that yet. And we need people uh, as active, as efficient as the FSF uh, to, to do this. So I'm about to finish. So the take home. Uh, what, what, what should you remember from, the, from that conference? Well, the community is still a tiny player, and uh, I should have put the, the figure back up here. That big blue, uh, we have to realize we're only in the tiny little red uh, portion of, of that big circle, okay? We, we like to think of ourselves as, as the, the kings, and we're so proud of what we do, and we write really the best software around. Look, no viruses on, on Ubuntu, that's that's fantastic achievement. Um, but we're still in the 1% segment. Free software needs to be made relevant. We need to talk down and think Joey and explain to Joey why it's important that his software is free, not because he can edit the code. He doesn't care about the code. I try to speak about the societal impact of having free or non-free software. Quality is not a priority. I think I, I said this quite a few times, but of course, people uh, often <laughs> ask questions, but look, people choose Firefox because, because it's good quality. Uh, but they don't. They, they will say, yes, I chose it because it's good quality, but they first of all got attracted to the product, uh, feel it's a sexy product, attracted to the community for much totally different reasons than quality. Just the same that people buy in France, in France people buy a ger German car saying it's good quality, but first of all, they're attracted to the image of having a German car, um, not the quality itself. 
And business thinking is the key. So try to think of your market and, and uh, try to, of course, the price is not a nice dis uh, discriminative um, uh, factor to, to, to make that curve over there. But try to think of what people want. And typically, people have different needs according to the environment they're in. So business thinking, market thinking can really uh, make a difference, and help us overtake. And I'd just like to finish with a quote. Um, the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And I like this quote a lot, stays on my desk all day, uh, for two reasons. Because first of all, I think we have a very good thing, this is free software, and it's tight in the bud in that little portion of the circle I've shown earlier. And it really needs to blossom, I think. And the second reason is because um, uh, a year ago, I gave up most of, uh, almost a year ago, nine months ago, gave up all my studies and jobs just to work full-time in Linux matters. And it was, uh, it's, it's not a lot of fun all the time. It was m more painful to not do it uh, um, than, than to do it. So I don't regret any time. So I'm finished. Um, over there is my email. I don't get quite a lot of feedback uh, of the addresses by email. Uh, there's also a feedback form on the, on the um, CCC uh, wiki, so please don't hesitate to put, to put feedback. And this is Linux Matters, the nonprofit. We work on the marketing on the internet. We're going to need lots of help um, in the coming year, so please, please uh, show up if you, if you want to. Thanks very much. Thanks. Hello. Hello. I just wanted to comment on this uh, don't give quality a priority issue. Uh, it depends a bit in what position you are, what you have to do best. If you are Microsoft and if, if you have 90% of the market, you can give a shit. You can sell everything. But uh -huh. if you want to grow and you deliver bad products, you won't grow. Sure. So you have to put quality very high uh, on your priority list. Maybe it's not the first priority, but I think it at least should be the second priority. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, well, I just want to emphasize that for most people, uh, the, the bug tracker is the project. Um, uh, everything is managed in there, and they're not coming out of, of this at all. They fo we focus on making very efficient software before we think of who's going to want it in the first place. And that's what I want to emphasize. Of course, quality is hugely important. If Firefox had security holes, it would never have reached 100 million people. Uh, that's clear. If the Linux kernel didn't uh, have this stability, then we would never have 10 million users. Uh, so quality, yes, it's highly important, but it's not, it should not be the focus. Um, and that's, that's why I tried to, to insist on it. Of course, it's hugely important. I'm happy that I have stable software. No one keeps doing this, no clue. Uh, I just have to leave it there. Sorry, any question? Why, why should I um, convince other people to use Linux or my application? Uh, it's for me just enough uh, to convince interested people. Uh, can you repeat the question? Why should you... Yes, why, why should I uh, convince other people about Linux or about my application? It's enough for me when I um, use it for my own or... Uh, it's, it's enough when uh, someone who is interested in it finds it in the internet. I don't need uh, to market... Uh, Linux don't need marketing. Okay. Um. <laughs> Well, um, um, links don't need, doesn't need marketing to exist, uh, that's for sure. But uh, I, I take the point of view of someone who wants to switch around the colors on the, on the first graph I showed up there. I really want free software to, to rule our society, to, for, for every machine around to have to rule free software. That's my point of view. Of course, it's not the point of view of everyone, and people just want to write good software, uh, make Linux just good software, and let people choose what they want. Um, it's, a, it's just a different point of view, uh, I, I suppose. I, I, believe, I believe to really make a difference, we need marketing. If we want to, we want to change this 99 versus 1% uh, balance, uh, we need mar it's, it's not going to happen alone. It's not going to happen by itself. Uh, we need to think about what the people want. 
but of course, if, if you just want to build your own software for just people who want it in your corner, uh, it's fine with me. I'm not, not going to blame people for that. Okay. Yes, questions? Uh, maybe here? Okay. Okay. Uh, just uh, one remark. I think that a big chance for us, also for the free software <coughs> proponents, is that hardware becomes cheaper and cheaper. Uh -huh. uh, and for instance, if you have to pay, uh, say, two hundred dollars for, for your non-free software, it's, it's okay if you pay two thousand dollars for your hardware. It's, it's just ten percent. But if, if you if you pay, have, just have to pay five hundred bucks for, for, the, for, for the hardware, it is a much bigger proportion. And, okay. and people just can't can't use the old computers this Vista. Uh, anymore. That's, that's another matter where we, we, another we, incentive. We, where we can push in. Okay, we, 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 can, we can push this in. The trouble is um, um, uh, p companies like Microsoft have huge cash uh, behind, left behind, uh, to do things like reduce the price of their software dramatically. So I'm pretty convinced that within a few years, within two or three years, Microsoft Windows, Microsoft Office will be free as in free, free price, uh, not as in free software. It will be just like Google application, half online or mostly online. Google applications are free to use as in, as in price, not as in freedom. And I think we should beware of that kind of tactic because I'm cheaper. Um, and usually when you use that tactic, you have Flying Steve coming around. So things like in Nigeria, we sold, I think, 17,000, but I think it's 20, 27,000, I can't remember exactly, computers with Mandriva pre-installed. Mandriva went there, convinced the people to, to buy this computer. And two weeks later, ta -da, they changed their minds. So they're still buying the computers, still buying the Mandriva support, and then they're going to install Windows on that. They don't have the means, they don't have financial means to install Windows, so they must have come free as in beer along the way. And so that argument, that I'm free as in beer, um, doesn't always work, that's, that's what I want to say. Now for a personal uh, person in, in Berlin um, to wish to spend this much money on their computer, yes, that's, that's an argument, but it doesn't always work, that's what I want to say, uh, we, have got, we got to beware. Just a question here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the guy saying that uh, Linux doesn't need any uh, business thinking or something. I think, I mean, if you're alone in your cellar and just uh, programming and using your applications, other people do use them as well, mm -hmm. uh, this is pretty nice and then you can stay in your cellar just doing it like this, but next time you just go out and see the sunlight and you want to buy maybe uh, you buy a wireless card or you buy an audio card or you buy a printer or something and you go there and they say yeah it's Windows only or it's Mac only and yeah, you should maybe check online for one hour if you find anything that's comfortable for Linux or uh, and this is which actually happens if you don't care enough if, if you don't care enough share. which uh, what uh, other people use as well so the point is not uh, what is the right choice it's just like your actions will have consequences yeah, so sure. don't only look at your actions but also at the consequences and if you're fine uh, just being able to use one percent of the hardware which is on the market this is your choice but I'm not willing to take this decision okay thanks very much for that time. Okay. and after I'll pass it around um, two things. Uh, first about quality again. You say quality is not that important to the customer and that may be true. Um, yeah, you, you uh, gave good examples for that. But um, quality is important uh, to me when I wish to con uh, convince people of free software. That means um, maybe it's not important to them, but if, if free software wouldn't have such a great quality, um, I wouldn't want to convince people anymore of it. Um, yeah. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, but, but again, take openoffice.org. Uh, they only start to worry about the quality now. Only start to worry about when you open open office and you have your page that sits on the left and not in the middle, and that's an annoying bug and it's not, not good quality. Um, and yet people downloaded it massively because it was a good market segment. It's market thinking uh, first and then quality second. But uh, ask, ask uh, look around in the company or something, what's the decisive the uh, process uh, to choose software, quality is often down, down the line. Not for the IT professional, but for, for the business manager. Uh, okay. So. Second thing, uh, that's honest. I think this was one of the best lectures I've heard on uh, uh, Case Communication Congress this year. Thanks very much for the, for the compliment. <laughs>
Yeah, there was a yeah, question. I'm, I'm with you if you say that market share matters. Of course it does. And, and we should try to get more and more of the market. But if it means changing Linux or BSD or whatever, the free software, to look more and more like Vista, to, to, to adapt, not to, to, to damp it down, to make the quality as bad as that of boss software is. It's the wrong way. I mean, uh, to, to give you an analogy, which you sure will understand because you're living in France, there, there sure are a lot more drinkers of Coca-Cola in the world than connoisseurs of, of Burgundy wine or, or a good Bordeaux. But if it means changing the wine to taste like Coke, I think it's the wrong way. You should educate the people that they can appreciate the qualities of a good wine. That would be the right way. If that is impossible, okay, then we should give up. Because I wouldn't like to, to drink Coke all the day when I could have wine. So I think that's a totally wrong way. If we can make people appreciate the qualities of good software and of free software, then it's the right thing to do. But if it means changing our software in a way that makes it more and more like the bad software, okay. the boss software, it, I, it's the wrong thing to do. I understand, but, but we, we, in, in saying this, you have the point of view of the IT manager. You have the point of view of most people here who do already care for software. And I take the example of tires. There's no way you are going to, anyone is going to convince me in the street or on the internet that I should worry about the tires of my car. I was just going to throw them away when they're worn and buy some new ones, whether or not there's some miracle of a really nice solution around. And so convincing people people that this is the better way is an extremely time-consuming uh, way to do things. Uh, and I, I come back to this. Um, the, the things are changing quickly. We don't have this much time to, to, to swap around the, 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 the picture right here. And I, I'm really thinking of the, of the, um, of the stakes uh, of the thing. I want, I want the world to look like a Wikipedia. The software world to look like Wikipedia, not like this. And I, I can't see how by lowering the quality of software, it's not really lowering, it's not, it's not worrying about it, of software, we're going to have boxes like this, and it's something that looks like um, the way uh, Microsoft sees, sees the world. I can't, see, I can't see this happening, things being copied, things being hacked, modified over, um, so I'm not afraid that we start uh, lowering our stand, uh, um, making the average with, with a lower common denominator. I, I'm not worried about this. I'm really, really worried that if we wait too long, uh, then that kind of DRM and trusted computing infested worlds will be a lot harder to change and a lot harder to make an effect. So we have to really think about, think about tires. I try to remind myself as well, because it's, it's, it's not hard, uh, to think about how much I care about tires, my car, and how difficult it would be for anyone, even standing outside of the entrance here, to convince me to change otherwise, because I have better things to do than, than think about this. So uh, I hope that's sort of a satisfactory answer. Yes? I also disagree on the point uh, that uh, quality wouldn't matter. It's I think it's it typical. matters. <laughs> um, okay. Because first of all, I agree with him that quality is one of the best arguments for free software, uh, contrary to uh, closed software, uh, contrary to Microsoft software, which is of bad quality. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, op um, Open Office is even of better quality than Microsoft Office. And the normal users I know uh, see this and they appreciate it. I, knew, uh, I know a lot of normal users, not nerds or whatever, who mm -hmm. changed from Microsoft Office to Open Office and say, hey, it's much better. It's of better well, quality. <laughs> and I think it's a good and relevant argument. And the second point is, I would feel bad if I wrote free software and it wasn't of good quality. I want I my software to be of good quality. Sure. Me too. And uh, I don't think that I should say in the public, I don't care about quality. Uh, okay, I, I don't think it, we should, <laughs> don't misunderstand me, I don't, I don't think we should not uh, well, announce in public that we don't care about quality. Um, but let, let me give you an example of the release cycle. 
typically we release when it's ready because we think of the, of the features first, then we work as hard as we can until the features are, are arrived and then we released. And it's not the way the end user sees things. The end users want to release every six months, regardless of what there is in there. It, it could be a minor update, it could be just a eye candy, but it doesn't matter. They want a minor update uh, every six months for software. For OpenOffice, for Ubuntu, it works. For WordPress, it works. For Inkscape, nothing. You just wait until the next version of GIMP for many, many projects out there. And that's mis we, because we focus on quality, we misunderstand what people want. And I disagree with, with you on, on the fact that, um, um, that it's going to it, I mean, it could be, that quality is the main argument for us. It's main argument probably for people close to us. But when you talk about the rest of the 99% of the market, it's not going to be the winning argument. And if we, we, we only have limited time when we work on projects, you can't do everything. If we focus too hard on quality, then we forget about what people want. OpenOffice did not start as a good quality program. Um, so it could be good quality now. I would, I would still, I still have my doubts about that. Um, it did not start as such, and there are many, many better quality programs out there. Abbey Word could, comes to mind. There are many other uh, editors and presentation programs out there. Uh, but to, to rise up and start to make a difference in the market, you need to worry about what, uh, what the market wants first, and then build the quality to, to, to follow, be, uh, follow behind, but not build the first quality first. But we, we can go on to, to discuss for hours. It, it's sure it's hard. When you write software to, uh, to release software which you don't, you're not really proud of, uh, it, it, really, it takes a lot of humility, I would say, uh, to do that, saying, okay, what are people going to think about this? Uh, but it really, it makes a difference. It makes a difference, uh, in my opinion. So we, we, uh, we can go on for, for quality talks forever, so whoever wants to go on forever after the conference, you're most welcome. <laughs> okay, I have a comment that isn't really about quality at least. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's ob possibly an obvious observation based on the, the comments from people about, you know, d uh, basically the question of why does Linux want to, or uh, free software want to take over this market in a way. Uh -huh. And um, I, I maybe got the feeling that uh, a certain focus, because uh, basically you're uh, conducting a marketing campaign in a way, and I was thinking maybe the focus of your marketing campaign should be slightly shifted towards the actual developers, because in a sense you're almost calling for foot soldiers in a war um, against uh, commercial software, and um, as everyone is probably aware, only a fool goes into a pointless war. Um, <laughs> this is happening at the moment. And um, you would need to sort of put a bit more effort into convincing us why that's even something that we want to do. Free software is, uh, I mean, from my point of view, free software developers are very selfish, but that's totally fine. That's the natural resource that free software comes from. We just happen to want to write software, and we make the software we want. If you want to convince us to write software that other people want, you have to put a lot of effort into convincing us why that's something we actually want to do. Okay. Because we're selfish people. Okay, thanks for the remark. Uh, uh, thanks for the remark. I will update the talk to, to spend more time on why we should uh, worry about them uh, before we worry about us for, uh, for the needs of software. Thanks very much for that. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on, on time? Uh, how, much, how much time do we have? Just okay, time now. Um, okay, so I, I gladly accept questions. One minute. Okay, one, one last question okay, here. One or? last question. I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Yes. No, I, I, well, it's, it's a metaphor. Of course, we need source code to, to, to write the right machine. I'm saying do away with source code when we talk to Joey. Uh, so we're not, source code usually runs 
uh, the, the home page of most excellent software projects. Uh, it's, it's there, it's right in your face, uh, download the source code, modify the source code, how to do it, and so on. And I'm thinking, let's do away with this. Hide this from the, from the end user who doesn't care uh, at all about, about source code. But of course, we, we, still need to, we still need source code and edit it and, and do it with a, um, SVN or whatever version, we, we, uh, version control system we have, or, and so on. I'm not saying changing our methodology, but just changing our communication to the end user. Um, as in, just, just type uh, Inkscape.org, is a, I think, is a good example. There are pl plenty of other projects where it's not obvious what the program actually does and how relevant it is to them uh, when, when you step there. And there's a lot of documentation and, and text, but, but, uh, uh, but nothing to describe what the program actually does. Okay, should we, should we? Okay, we're closing up. Thanks.